and start recording. So before we get into today's um, stuff, I kind of just wanted to do a quick announcement real quick about the extra credit. So I don't, I think I got one, one person's um, submission. So I don't know if everyone filled it out and maybe they didn't fill it out correctly and that's why I only got one or if people just haven't filled it out, okay? So I just wanna make you guys aware that it is still available. You just click on it, you read through the little prompts or whatever, and then the form is actually embedded into the assignment itself. So you just fill out the form that's right there at the bottom and then you submit it, okay? And it is worth 10 points toward your next um, test. And I do float the points. So if this next test gets replaced by the final exam score at the end of the semester, because the final exam score is better, then I'll take those 10 points and put them somewhere else where they'll still uh, credit you, okay? Um, so let me, now that we made that quick announcement, We'll go back to our paperwork. And so here we are. We kind of got all the way to this point in the last class, but we didn't actually get to graph the the, uh, the functions. So we were able to get to all of the techniques, right? We learned about what a vertical asymptote is, and you find it by taking your denominator equal to zero and then solving for x. We talked about horizontal asymptotes where if the degree or the highest exponent of the numerator and the denominator, if the numerator's degree is less than the denominator's degree, then the horizontal asymptote was automatically at y equals zero. But if the numerator's degree and the denominator's degree were the same, then you had the horizontal asymptote at the leading coefficients, okay? Um, and we talked about how we do not have oblique asymptotes in this class. So if you see anything that refers to oblique or even the word slant asymptotes, the answer is no, we don't have any of those in this class, okay? So if you see a question on there that says, does it have an oblique or slant? No, it doesn't, okay? Um, we also remember for to find the y-intercept, right? You just plug in zero for x, and then you'll find your y-intercept. To find the x-intercepts, you set the whole function equal to zero. So like it's like you're making the y value equal zero, right? And then you solve it and you figure out what your x-intercepts are. However, when you have a fraction, when you take a fraction and you equal it to zero, the first thing you're going to do is get rid of that fraction, okay? And so in essence, you're really only needing to take the numerator equal to zero to get your x-intercepts, okay? And then step five says to determine whether or not your graph will intersect the horizontal asymptote. So not necessarily non-vertical because we don't have slants. So just horizontal. And we'll do that and see if it happens as we keep going because we're gonna have different kinds of problems with different asymptotes. And so if we get a horizontal asymptote, um, we'll see if the graph is gonna intersect it or not. Okay, um, and then the last thing is basically just to choose any extra points that you need and then complete your sketch, okay? So we're gonna go through those steps for this first problem, which is example five. So the first thing that we're gonna need to do is find the vertical asymptotes. And so I believe this one is like the one we did in the last class where they just asked us what the asymptotes were. But let me make sure, because if so, I don't have to do all that work all over again, right? So yeah, actually it is. Um, we covered example four in the last class, okay? And if you were to multiply this all out, that would be six X minus X, which is five X, okay? So we have done the asymptotes for this particular problem already. So if you were to write this in its factored form, this would be 2x minus 1 and then x plus 3, okay? However, if it's not in its factored form, I kind of actually want to talk about how you would do it if it weren't in its factored form, because chances are 
your default is not going to be to factor it. Um, and so I want to work with that because I know mostly everyone's not going to factor that. Okay. Especially because there's a number in front. So if I were working on my vertical asymptote, I would have to take my denominator and equal it to zero. So in this case, that means I'm taking this denominator and I'm equaling it to zero. Now, the faster way to do it would be to factor it, but that's only if you're fast at factoring, right? If you're not fast at factoring or you just don't like factoring, <laughs> you can avoid it here. All you have to do is the quadratic formula. So we could do negative b plus or minus b squared minus four times a times c. And then over to a. So then when I type this in my calculator, um, let me see, that's six, that's 24. So 25 plus 24 is actually 49. And then the square root of 49 is a nice number. It's just seven. So we have um, negative five plus seven over four, which gives me one half. And we have negative five, oops, let me do this right, fraction, negative five minus seven over four. I get negative three. And let's see if that's what we got the last time. One half and negative three. It is what we got the last time. Good, good, good. So those are gonna be my vertical asymptotes. So I like to draw things as I go, but not everyone does that. So for me personally, I would put, here's positive one half right here. I would draw that vertical asymptote right now. And I'm gonna kind of zoom in so you could see what I'm doing here, okay? So between zero and one is gonna be that one half. And so I'm just gonna try to draw a vertical dotted line. So that's gonna represent my vertical asymptote. Now remember, you can never touch or cross this vertical asymptote, okay? We also have another one at negative three. So I'm gonna do the same thing at negative three. And there's my vertical asymptote at negative three. So I absolutely will never have a point on either of these dotted lines, okay? So the next thing we wanna do, this was step one. The next thing we wanna do is step two, which is the horizontal asymptote. And that one we get by comparing the degrees or the highest exponents. So if I look at my numerator, and then I'll look at my denominator. So for the numerator, the highest exponent of x is just a little invisible one. And the highest exponent for x in the denominator is actually the square, right? So the degree is two. So I have the case where my degree of my numerator is less than the degree of my denominator, which means I have a horizontal asymptote automatically at y equals zero. It's only when they're the same number, the same exponent, that you do the, the fraction. But when the top exponent is smaller than the bottom exponent, it's automatically at zero. Now this one, because it's gonna be right on top of that x-axis, I'm gonna do it in a different color, just so it can stand out. Um, so I'm gonna do in this brighter color just so you can see that horizontal asymptote. It's right on top of the x-axis. Okay, we're gonna move on to step three, which is to find the y-intercept. And to do that, all we do is plug in zero for x. So I end up with positive one on the top and then zero, zero minus three, negative three at the bottom. So negative one third, okay? 
So I plugged in zero for X and I got negative one third. Now this point's gonna be a little difficult to draw too. So zero and negative one third is like pretty close to zero. It's like about right there. So it's not touching that dotted line, but my pin is has somewhat of like a, it's not a fine point. So <laughs> it's just a medium point. So it kind of looks like it almost touches, but it doesn't. Or at least it shouldn't, right? Now we'll move on to step four. Step four says for us to find the x-intercepts. So to do that, we're gonna take just the numerator equal to zero. So my numerator is just x plus one. And it's focusing is not good right now. So let me click the focus. There we go. And then I can, there it goes, much better. So when I solve this equation, I'm gonna get x equal to negative one. So I only have one x-intercept, negative one comma zero, because I set it equal to zero. So that's going to actually be here. Now we actually already did the next step, but I'm gonna show you how it works out in case it's not the same spot. Because I obviously touched the pink line, right? So I touched my horizontal asymptote. So apparently I do intersect the horizontal asymptote. But the question is, is like, how would we know? Okay, so to see, so does graph intersect the horizontal asymptote? It's interesting because here I got a horizontal asymptote of zero, right? So anytime your y value equals zero, you are talking about the x-intercepts. But what if it wasn't zero? We still have to have a process of how we figure out whether our graph touches that horizontal asymptote, okay? And all you do is you take your function, whatever it was, and you set the whole thing equal to your horizontal asymptote. My horizontal asymptote happens to be zero from step two. And when you have a fraction equation like this, the first thing you want to do is get rid of those fractions. So the first thing you would do is multiply by this denominator on both sides of your equation. And here it would cancel. And here, anything times zero is still going to be zero. And so then all you're left with is just the numerator. Well, isn't that the exact same equation that I just finished solving, right? And so you get that same exact point. X is negative one and your Y, your Y equals zero for your horizontal asymptote. So it is the same exact spot, but we can literally visually see it if we plotted it. But this just kind of confirms why. If you're working out the problems out on a test um, and you have a horizontal asymptote of zero, you do not have to do this part because it's going to be the same, okay? You're taking the Y value and equaling it to zero and you will end up with the numerator equal to zero. So you don't have to show this part if your horizontal asymptote is zero. However, if your horizontal asymptote is not zero, you do have to show this part, okay? So we'll see it in a different example. Now, step six is just to find more points. So create a chart and see how many more points you have. So I have, I have two points in here. Now, since I don't have any other x-intercepts, I'm pretty sure that this thing has to go downward, okay? I'm not gonna draw it, but it has to go downward. The issue is, is I don't know if this one's gonna go back down or if it's gonna go up, okay? So I probably wanna plug in negative two for X 
to see whether I get a positive y value or a negative y value so I know where that little guy is going to go. But I also don't know what's happening on the other side, on the outsides of my vertical asymptotes. I have a real good idea now what's happening in between them, but I don't know what's happening outside. Okay, so I'm going to pick two points to the right of this vertical asymptote, and I'm going to pick two points to the left of this vertical asymptote. So maybe like negative five, negative four, and then over here, maybe like two and three. And that should be enough for me to figure out what's going on in my picture, okay? Now to do all of these, I am gonna do the shortcut by programming the calculator. So the first thing we do is set the first one. So negative two, let me put this up so you can see what I'm pushing. And I think that will help too. So I'm gonna do negative two store as X. So that's the store button. And then this is the X and I'm gonna hit enter and it should save that X value. Now I can just type in this fraction with the X's in it. So X plus one at the top. And then at the bottom, I will do two X squared plus five X minus three. And when I hit enter, since I stored negative two as X, it's just gonna plug in negative two, okay? So it looks like this right now, but as soon as I hit enter, it's gonna plug in that negative two. And I get one fifth. And I'm gonna do the same thing for these guys. I just don't have to type that again because I can go up and copy it, okay? So negative five store as X and hit enter. Now negative, x is negative five now. So I'll go up to that whole expression and hit enter to copy it. And then when I hit enter again, it'll plug in the negative five. And so I get negative two over 11. I'm gonna keep going. So negative four stores x, go highlight and then enter twice. And then two stores X. I get one fifth and then three stores X. And I get two over 15. And I don't know what those fractions are exactly, but they're pretty small. Okay, so I'm going to try my best to graph this. So negative two and positive one fifth is really close to zero, but not quite at zero, but it's positive. So that means it's above the pink line, which means I am going to curve upward like that, okay? So it kind of looks like a flipped over X cube in the middle, right? Now with the other side, negative five and negative two eleven. Now, negative 2 elevenths is smaller than negative 1 thirds. So for negative 5, it's going to be really close to that pink line. And for negative 4, it's going to be just slightly below that. Okay, because negative 1 third is a bigger negative. And then that helps me. I know that it's going this way, and I cannot cross this line. So I have no choice but to go downward. So you got one arrow going in that direction and one arrow going down. Now we'll do the other two points. So one fifth is bigger than two, fifth, two fifteenths. So if I do two and one fifth, that's gonna be about there. And then two and two fifteenths, that's gonna be even smaller. So it's really close to the pink line. So then that helps me because I know this one's going like that towards the pink line and this one's going up towards that dotted line. And it looks real tiny because all my Y values are like super, super tiny, right? If they were bigger and this wasn't a 10 by 10, it could look a little bit bigger. Um, but we have drawn it. So 
So we have, I think we have two more examples where we're gonna draw them. And then we're gonna get to some other problems. Cause I noticed that this whole packet, it doesn't give you all the problems that you see in the homework. So I wrote down a couple of extra problems because they gave us the function and then asked us to graph it. There's some problems in your homework though that give you the graph or they give you information about the graph. And then they ask you to give them the function. And so I definitely want to talk about those because those are a little funny. Um, there's no box to tell me how to do those. So those we definitely need to talk about. Okay, but let's go ahead and try to do these six steps with another problem so we can draw a different one. And maybe it might not have a horizontal asymptote at zero. So we may have to do something extra on that step five. So we'll start it off again, just the same as the other one. We'll do a step one, which is your vertical asymptotes. So we're gonna take our denominator, equal it to zero. In this case, it's X minus three. So then I get X equal to positive three. And I only get one, one vertical asymptote. Then if I wanna go do my horizontal asymptote, I have to look at those degrees. Well, the degree of the numerator, highest exponent of X is one. And the degree of the denominator, the highest exponent is also one. So this time they're the same. When they're the same, the horizontal asymptote is at y equals the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. So in my case, the number in front of this x is a two in the numerator, and the number in front of x at the bottom is just a one. And two over one is just two. I'm gonna use the pink pen again for the horizontal asymptote. So it's at y equals two, which here's where y equals two. So there's where I'm gonna draw my vertical line. Oops, we got one person in here. So we've got that one there. Now for step three, we're gonna do our y-intercept. So we're going to take our function and just plug in zero. Remember, f is just a fancy way of saying y. And I get zero plus one, which is one. Zero take away three is negative three. So I still have um, zero for x and negative one third for y. So that's pretty close to right there for my y-intercept. Step four is my x-intercepts. So I'm gonna take my numerator equal to zero. So two x plus one equals zero. I can minus the one over but then I have to divide by the two. And so I end up with X equaling negative one half and the Y value was zero. For X intercepts, your Y value will always be zero. So we've got negative X one half, negative one half and zero. It's right in between zero and negative one, but on the X axis. Now, number five, we have to do it on this time because notice that it's not y equal to zero this time, right? We have y equal to two this time. So you have to take your whole function. Oops, it's a minus three. And equal it to that horizontal asymptote. And then I would do the same thing as before, get rid of the fraction, right? So we'll multiply both sides by that denominator. And over here, it'll cancel, leaving me just two X plus one. 
But over here, we have to actually distribute. So we'll get 2x minus 6. And if I try to solve this, I would have to minus the two x's over. And they actually cancel, and I end up with 1 equal to negative 6. That's what's called the contradiction. It's not true, right? 1 does not equal negative 6. Um, and since I couldn't get any answers, like x equals this or x equals that, then that means this thing does not touch my horizontal asymptote. So this right here means I have no solution. And if I have no solutions, that means the horizontal asymptote does not intersect the graph, which means the graph does not touch the horizontal asymptote. So I should not be touching this pink line at all in this particular problem, okay? So that's helpful to know because then that means I already know what's happening to the left of this vertical asymptote. I already got two points that tell me everything I need to know. Since this one's above that one, I know that it has to go in that direction. It can't go the other way. It can't go down like this because you can't cross this vertical asymptote. And it can't go up because you can't cross that pink asymptote. And then the other way, it has to go downward. I am not allowed to touch the pink line, so I have no choice but to go down. But I do need to make a chart for step six because although I do have this part of the graph, I don't have anything for this side of the graph. So if I make my little chart, all you need is two points, two points on each side or section around your vertical asymptotes, okay? So since I have one vertical asymptote, I need two points on this side and I need two points on that side, okay? We just already happen to have the two points on the left side. So for the right side, I'm gonna plug in four and I'm just gonna go crazy and plug in seven. Okay, so it's way over there. I don't know why I put them there. They're X's. Okay, so we'll use the calculator again for this part. It's just faster for me if I do that that way. So I'm gonna do four store is X, and then I'm gonna enter this fraction. Two X minus one. Oh, it's two X plus one, sorry. Plus one, and then X minus three. And as soon as I hit enter, it's going to plug in that four. And so we get nine. Then I'm going to do seven store X. Go highlight that thing. Copy it and then hit enter to plug in the seven. And I get 15 over four. That's about, or it is actually equal to 3.75. Because I was looking at 15 over 4, like I don't know where to <laughs> I don't know where to put that that point. But if it's in its decimal, then that gives me a better idea. So we have four and nine, which is way up there. And then we have seven and 3.75. So about right here. And that's all I need. That's enough for me to know. I can't cross the pink line and I can't cross the blue line. So it has to go upward like that, and this one has to trail off to the right, okay? Because you can't cross the pink line and you cannot cross that blue dotted line. We have one more, and we should have known too, right? This one says it does not intersect its horizontal asymptote. So it kind of gave us a clue there that it wasn't going to intersect. And sure enough, it didn't. But at least now we know what it looks like when it doesn't, right? Now, number seven, though, says it will intersect this horizontal asymptote. So that'll be interesting. We'll see what happens when we do that one.
Okay. So for number seven, we're going to follow those same steps. Okay. The same six steps. And those six steps will be written out for you. They won't be with the blanks and all my scribbles all over the place. <laughs> It'll just be a nice clean box with all the steps. Okay. When you take the, the test. So for this one, we're gonna start off with the first step. And you also have your open notes, right? So if you're doing good notes, with especially with the review, if you're writing down all those solutions and showing all your steps and where they're coming from and how you're getting them, explaining to yourself stuff, um, it should help when you take the test. So this one, I'm gonna take my denominator equal to zero, which is this guy. Now this one I can factor because it doesn't have a number in front. So it's easier to factor when there's no number in front. But if you don't like factoring, by all means, do the quadratic formula. You'll get the same two answers that I get. Okay, or actually it's just one answer. So I know that four times four adds to give me um, eight. And if I want it to be a positive eight, then both of these would have to be positive. So they multiply to give me positive 16, and when they combine, they give me positive eight. And if I were to FOIL it out and combine my like terms, I should get that, okay? But when it's the same thing twice, it can be written like this, with just a square. And then if I'm trying to solve for x, I would take the square root of both sides, and you usually get plus or minus, but the square root of zero is zero. There's no such thing as plus or minus zero. It's just zero. So if I minus the four over, I just get the one value x equal to negative four. If you were to do the zero factor property instead of the square root property, if you were to start here, you could have just taken this guy equal to zero and this factor equal to zero. And you would have ended up with the same answer twice, right? You would have ended up with x equal to negative four and another x equal to negative four. So even if you had done it up here, you still would get the same answer just twice. And if you do the Pythagorean, not Pythagorean theorem, the quadratic formula, you'll also just get one answer, which is negative four. Your radical part will just be zero. Okay, so we have one vertical asymptote and it's at negative four. Oops. So we'll do our horizontal asymptote and that one has to do with the degrees. So the degree of your numerator and the degree of the denominator. So highest exponent for x at the top is the square, two. Highest exponent at the bottom is also a square, which is the two. So in this case, they're the same again, which means that the horizontal asymptote is at y equals the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. So the number in front of that x squared guy. So three for the top and an invisible one for the bottom, which gives me the horizontal asymptote y equal to three. So let me draw that. Here's where y equals three and there's my horizontal asymptote. Now step three, we'll do our y-intercept. So we just plug in zero. So this will be zero, zero, and then negative six, zero, zero, and then 16, which is negative three over eight. So my point is zero for X and negative three over eight for Y. I don't know what's up with all these tiny, tiny numbers. <laughs> Normally they're bigger than this, but it's okay. 
So neg zero and negative three over eight is somewhere between zero and negative one. So I'm just gonna put it about right there. It's a Y intercept. Now for step four, we're gonna find the X intercepts or intercept, it could be one or more. And that one you get by taking the numerator equal to zero. Really you're doing the whole fraction equal to zero, but we know what happens when we multiply both sides by the denominator, right? Zero times the denominator is gonna be zero. And then on the other side, the denominator is gonna cancel, leaving you with just the numerator. So you end up with this, okay? Now let's see, we have three X squared minus three X minus six. Now this I am gonna factor also because it is, even though it has a number in front, I noticed that all of them can be divided by three, which means it really doesn't have a number in front. So I could factor out that three and then it would just be X and then it would be two. And then I could factor that trinomial. So x times x is x squared. Two times one is the only way you're gonna to multiply to get two. I just have to figure out what the signs need to be so that when I add them together, I get a negative one, right? Because you have a negative one in the middle here. So that means that my bigger number is gonna to have to be negative. And if you're not sure, you could FOIL these out, combine the like terms, you should get that. And then if you distribute the three, you should get the original. So this all should be equivalent to each other. But once it's in its factored form, you really can't take three equal to zero. Three is not ever gonna equal to zero. So this one doesn't really give you any, uh, there's no solution here. So you don't get any x-intercepts from this particular factor, okay? But you still have two other factors. You have x minus two that also equals zero, and x plus one that also needs to equal zero. So even though you don't get any numbers for here, you might still get some from over here. So when I solve this, I actually end up with x equal to positive two. And when I minus one, I end up with x equal to negative one. And so you do have two x-intercepts. So two for x, zero for y, negative one for x, zero for y. Remember, an x-intercept is on the x-axis and the y-values are zero there, right? So they should always be those points. So two and zero is here and negative one and zero is here. This is interesting. It looks like it kind of looks like a U-shape, but I don't know what's going on. So let's keep, <laughs> let's keep working. So we'll do number five. Does the horizontal asymptote intersect the graph? We don't know. We have to take our whole function Oops, I wrote 18 instead of eight. Now we have to equal it to the horizontal asymptote. Our horizontal asymptote was y equal to three. So we have to set this whole thing equal to three. And then what's gonna happen? We have to get rid of that denominator, right? So we'll multiply both sides by that denominator. Why does my brain keep wanting to write 18? I don't know. It'll count over here, but on the other side, we actually have to distribute it. So we'll get 3x squared, 3 times 8 would be 24x, and then 3 times 16, I believe is 48, but let me double check in my calculator. 3 times 16, okay, yes, 48. And now we need to get everybody, all the variable people to one side, okay? So we'll minus the three X squared on both sides and we'll leave a minus 24 X on both sides. So we can kind of move both of these variables over to this side. Well, it actually cancels the three X squared on both sides and these guys cancel on that side, leaving you just the 48. But over here you get negative 27 X. 
minus six. So then we'll add six to both sides. And let me see, 48 plus six is 54. And then if I divide by negative 27 on both sides, I get that X will be by itself. And it will be equal to divided by negative 27. It'll be equal to negative two. So we do intersect our horizontal asymptote. Now X is negative two, and the Y that we plugged in was three. So I do touch the pink line on this graph and it happens at negative two and three. So negative two and three. And that is the only place that I touch this graph. So that's gonna be very important when I try to draw whatever's happening to the right of my vertical asymptote. I'm definitely going to need a chart for step six, but I only need two points because I don't have any part of the graph to the left of my vertical asymptote. I have exactly what I need to figure out what's going on the right side, but I have nothing on the left side. So I'm going to plug in, I don't know, negative six for X and then maybe negative eight. Okay. So let me program my calculator, negative six door X. And then let me type in this whole function here. Oops, I'm not at the bottom. Let's to the bottom, there we go. X squared plus 16, there we go. And I get 30, well, that's way off the chart. Let's try to plug in eight, negative eight. What is that? 105 over eight. So it was about 13 point something, right? That one I can't really draw, I can't draw both of those. Let me see, let's do negative nine. Oh gosh, what is that? 10.56. I could probably draw that on my graph. <laughs> now let me do negative 10 just to see if I get another number, a second point that's not off the chart. Okay, see, I get positive nine. So these were weird. These two are completely off the chart. 30, my graph only goes up to 10. It doesn't go all the way to 30. So I couldn't draw that one. This one was 13 point something, which I probably could have drawn. I just would have had to go above my graph paper a little bit. Um, so I didn't do that one either. And then this one's 10.56. That's just a tiny smidget above 10. Okay, that one I could graph. And then this one is nine. So negative nine for X and 10.56 is just a little tiny bit above 10, right? And then negative 10 and nine is actually gonna be here. There we go. So that's all I need for this left side because I know that I'm not gonna ever touch this blue line. And the only place I was allowed to touch the pink line was right there. So it should not be touching the pink line over here, which means this will go like that and trail close to the pink line. And this one will eventually get close to that blue line and trail close to that blue line, okay? Now the other part, I haven't drawn it yet because it's a little bit weird. <laughs> so you do have, if I connect these, you do have this sort of thing happening, right? Now it's already going upward, okay? And it doesn't say that I'm gonna come back down, okay? So we have to continue this motion and it's just gonna get closer and closer to that dotted line. Now over here, I also don't have any other x-intercepts. So you're most likely not gonna be coming back down here or going like this and coming back down here, but you do have this horizontal asymptote and we talked about it, that's where the ends are gonna go. So this arrow will go like this. It will trail off in that direction.
It's just really weird looking. Now on the test, I will ask you for these pieces of information, but the graph itself is multiple choice. So you'll just choose which graph matches your information, okay? You don't have to actually draw it. You just pick the one that matches what you have on paper, okay? Let me see how we're doing on time. 102, okay. So I think we'll have enough time to cover these. They're like the ones in the homework, they're just not in, the, in this um, packet for the notes. So for the rest of the notes, everything is crossed out. So page 32 is crossed out, page 33 is crossed out, page 34 is crossed out. So all the rest of the 3.5 notes, we won't use, okay? There's no word problems in your homework or on your reviews or on your tests that have fractions. Um, they're not asking you about those slant asymptotes or those oblique asymptotes, which is happening in these last two examples, okay? So we don't have to do any more of those. However, you do have some problems in your homework that look like these. So there's two different kinds. There's one where they give you the graph and they ask you to tell them what the function is. And then the other is where they give you information and then ask you to tell them what the function is, okay? And so we need to be able to figure out how to use this information to come up with your function, okay? Now I'm gonna try to summarize it because there's no little box that tells you how to do it. Um, the easiest way that I can explain it is to use a template, okay? So you have a coefficient, and then you're gonna have all of your x-intercepts. Remember, we think we use the letter C. So you have your first x-intercept, your second x-intercept, and so on and so forth, depending on how many x-intercepts you have, okay? So your numerator will tell you the x-intercepts, okay? The denominator tells you where the vertical asymptotes happen, right? So for these, you might have a coefficient, but it would be x minus, and just to be consistent, I'm using v for the vertical asymptote. So maybe your first vertical asymptote value, and then if your second one, or if you have more, those would all be at the bottom, okay? Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna use, cause they always give you your y-intercept as well, whether it be in the graph or whether it be in these bits of information. They're always gonna give you the y-intercept. So you're going to use that y-intercept. Remember that this is y. To figure out what those a and b's are, okay? Well, you'll use the horizontal asymptote to figure out what the a and b is, um, but we'll actually use the y-intercept if we need to know, if we don't have enough information with that, okay? So, um, for this particular problem, the first example that I have here, um, I'm just gonna kind of write off, I'm basically gonna turn this graph into this, okay? Where I just want the bits of information and then we'll put it together to come up with our function, okay? So one thing I notice is that I have two x-intercepts here. So I notice that my x-intercepts are at zero, zero, and one, two, three, four, five, so this should be two and zero for y, okay? So those are the coordinates of my x-intercepts. My y-intercept also happens to be that zero, zero, right? It's the same, same as the x-intercept. I do have vertical asymptotes and I just have one. And it's right here at one. So it's at x equals one. And I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals one, two, three, four, five. So it's at three, okay? So I'm essentially turning this problem into a problem like the other ones. So we'll just get extra practice with the other two examples on how to come up with these functions, okay? So for the template, this horizontal asymptote, if it's a number, it automatically gives you what A and B are, okay? 
because I can write this as three over one. And that should be the leading coefficient A, and this should be the leading coefficient B. If it's zero though, you can't use it to figure out what A and B are. And I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen. It happens to us over here. So we'll see how to deal with it if it's not a number and it's zero. But for now, it's just three. So it does tell us the A and the B, okay? Now remember the X intercepts, this is the first X value. So that's C1. And then this one is C2. In my vertical asymptote, I just have one. That's gonna be V1. If I had another vertical asymptote, he would be V2. So I'm gonna fill in what I have so far. And so far I have that Y equals three for A, one for B, and then X minus this X intercept, X minus this X intercept. And then at the bottom, I only have one vertical asymptote, so X minus one. Okay, now there's something wrong here because the intercept, the y-intercept is supposed to be zero, zero, right? Which means when you plug in zero for x, you should end up with zero for y. Um, and right now, I think you will get that, but this is not the correct graph, okay? This is not the correct function so far. And the reason why is because in order for my horizontal asymptote to be a number, that means that the degree of my numerator should be the same as the degree of my denominator, okay? So I should have the same degree in the top and the bottom, which means I should have the same number of multiples with X in them as I do at the top and the bottom. And if you notice at the top, you have one factor with X and you have a second factor with X. So if I were to multiply these things out, I would end up with an X squared, but I don't have an X squared at the bottom, okay? And I don't have another vertical asymptote either to have another parentheses over here. So what can I do to make it have the same degree as the numerator but not give me an extra vertical asymptote? The answer is you have to square this guy, okay? Because if you square him, it's not gonna give you any more different vertical asymptotes. When you set this guy equal to zero, you'll still get X equal to one. But now the bottom has an X squared and the top has an X squared. And that's what allows you to get a horizontal asymptote of Y equal to a number. Remember that only happens when the two exponents are the same from the top and the bottom. And they don't usually like you to leave this like this. So we will have to clean it up. We'll have to change that to just X because X minus zero is just X. And then they don't usually write the one in front. So it usually just looks like this, okay? And so this is your answer. And you can check it. If I plug in zero for X, I will get zero times negative two, which is zero over one. But zero over one is zero. So you plugged in zero for X and you got zero for Y. So it does check out, okay? And if you had not put that two there, the Y intercept would still check out. Problem is, is that this without the square doesn't have a horizontal asymptote at three. My top exponent is bigger than my bottom exponent. So without the square, it would look like it doesn't have a horizontal asymptote. Okay. So make sure you put them, if you have a number, the degrees need to be the same. So let's try to look at the next one and see what we can come up with for this one. This one's kind of similar. I just don't have the zero, zero situation. Okay. So we're gonna figure this out. Remember our horizontal asymptote, this guy is gonna tell us our A and B. So one is the same as one over one, which means that's my A. 
and that's my B. And then this is my C1 and my C2, my two x-intercepts. And my vertical asymptote is V1. The y-intercept we'll use to check everything, okay? Now remember, again, this is y equal to a number, which automatically tells me that the degree of the numerator has to equal the degree of the denominator. That's the only way I'm gonna get y equal to a number that's not zero. So let's put it together. We get y equals one for a, x minus a negative three, x minus a six. At the bottom, I have one for b, and then I have x minus one for v1. Oh, it is very similar to the last one, right? You have x times x, which is gonna give you x squared. But at the bottom, we only have one x and they have to have the same degrees. So you have to put the little square there so that now the top has an x squared and the bottom will have an x squared. And so if I clean this up, you don't need to write the one, that will actually turn into x plus three. And you don't need to write that one either. So it's just like this. And we can verify whether or not we have this y-intercept. So if I plug in zero for x, I get three times negative six over negative one squared, which is negative 18 over positive one, which is negative 18. And that's exactly what it should be, right? When x is zero, the y should be negative 18. And I did get y equal to negative 18. So this is my function. The computer might not want y equals, it might want f of x equals. So pay attention to whether they want y equals or if they already have it typed in. They might already have f of x equals and then you're just typing in the fraction. Okay, we only have one more, and this is all we're gonna cover today. So we're not gonna go into any other sections or anything. We're just finishing this section. So if we look at this particular problem, it's very, very similar, okay? We have the x-intercept, so that guy's like C1 and C2. We have the vertical asymptote, just one of them. So that's the V1. This is the one that tells us a lot. Those horizontal asymptotes are super important, okay? So it doesn't tell me what A and B are, okay? It doesn't at all. We're gonna have to figure that out, okay? It doesn't tell me what A and B are, but what it does tell me, in order for me to have got a horizontal asymptote at Y equals zero, I would have had to have had a smaller degree in the numerator than I do in the denominator, okay? You have to, there's no other way to figure it out, okay? Now, if I put this in the template, okay? And so I wanna make sure that we understand here too, you don't have to write A and B. If you notice, every single time, it's always been a whole number, right? And so your B has always been just one, which really disappears. The A has always been that numerator guy, the numerator coefficient. Three was my numerator coefficient. So really what's important is that we find that guy. Now I can't say that it's zero, right? Because if I plug in zero, then there's not gonna be nothing in my numerator. The whole function is just gonna equal zero, okay? And it doesn't, it, it has to equal something because it's got all this information. Okay, so you cannot just plug it in. But instead of me finding A and B individually, I can just find out what number this is all together. And then I can pick apart what goes in the numerator and what goes in the denominator. So if I figure out that this number, this whole number, the whole thing, this guy, 
If I figure out that that number in the front is five, then I know that A is five and B is one because five is five over one, right? If I figure out that that number is one half, then I know A is one and B is two, okay? So we don't need to figure out A and B individually. We just need to figure out what that number is and the numerator will be A and its denominator will be B, okay? But how do we figure out what that number is, okay? I, I'm just gonna put a question mark because I don't wanna use any other letters, okay? So you have, so far, we have y equals some coefficient and then our x-intercepts. So x minus the c1, x minus the c2, which is the negative one. And then at the bottom, we have x minus one. Now we do have to talk about this because the degree of the numerator is supposed to be smaller than the degree of the denominator. But right now I have x squared at the top and I only have x at the bottom. And if I put a square here, then I'll have x squared at the top and x squared at the bottom. That's still not this situation. My top needs to be smaller, which means I do have to put a cube or fourth power or fifth power something so that I can get a number bigger at the bottom than at the top. I'm gonna try it with the three, we'll see where it goes, okay? I don't think it's gonna matter whether I cube it or fourth power or whatever, because this will always still be, well, I don't know, it might matter, we'll see. So let's rewrite this, some number, times x minus two and the double negatives will turn into x plus one. And we're gonna try it with the cube. Now remember, they gave us one extra bit of information and that's the y-intercept. So when I plug in zero, I should get six, okay? So when I plug in zero for x, I should get six for y. Now let's go figure out what number, what this number is getting multiplied by. So I end up with negative two times one over negative one cubed. This guy is getting multiplied by negative two over negative one. So that question mark's really just getting multiplied by a positive two. So if I wanna figure out what the question mark is, I'm gonna to have to divide both sides by two. And so we figure out that the question mark is equal to three. So the number that's getting multiplied by here is a three. Well, remember, three is three over one, which means my A is three and my B is one. So when I write my final answer, the A is gonna be a three at the top, X minus two, and instead of a double negative, I'm gonna put x plus one. And at the bottom, my coefficient is gonna be a one, which I don't need to write, but you have x minus one cubed. So these are very, very, very tricky. The ones that give you the information and then ask you for the functions. And you really have to look at those horizontal asymptotes. Now I did give you one of each kind, so I gave you one with the graph, I gave you one, two of them with the informations, and then I also gave you what's happening if they give you a number or what's happening if they give you a zero, okay? Um, if you get stuck on these when you're working on them in the, in the homework, let me know, okay? So we can talk about it and, and work it out and come up with your, your solution, okay? Um, you just have to text me and I can help you through them. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, if not, then you guys are free to go. Just don't forget, um, one, to work on these homework assignments, and then two, if you have time to do the extra credit assignment at the bottom of the week 10 module, okay? So if you have time, those are worth 10 points on the test. So that's a whole letter grade, okay? They are worth doing. Um, but other than that, you guys are free to go and I hope to see you on Thursday. Have a good day.
You too. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. You too.